We should be very thankful for the fact that in so much of what is now modern hymnody, there is so much theology. We went through a period in the second half of the 20th century when almost all the new music was vapid and empty of any kind of biblical or theological content. And we are now in a, in a blessed season of so much new music. You think of the hymn in Christ alone. Uh, behold, uh, before the throne of God above. There's, just, there's rich theology there. We did go through a bad season, we just need to admit. We went through a really bad season. And I was, I was a young person in the midst of that season. I hesitate to think some of the songs we sang in the youth group of my church, some which we sang with gusto. And I look back upon reflection and realize there was absolutely nothing to them. Um, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Uh, to which we added the sanctified, deeply theological verses, you know, give me wax on my board, keep me surfing for the Lord. <laughs> give me wax on my board, I pray. Or, uh, you know how bad it was. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we just sang them as sincere idiots, basically, uh, without realizing that this was, uh, this was completely empty. And uh, maybe even worse at times. But we're in a... We're in a season now of much good new hymnody. But you look back at the hymn we just sang and, and think of the words, be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Be of sin the double cure. How many hymns talk about a double cure? First of all, Christ's substitutionary atonement saving us, redeeming us, making full atonement for our sin, dying in our place, but then that same atonement washing us clean. Two, two different dimensions of the work of Christ. We just sang it. We actually had to sing it twice. We sang it with the organ and we sang it a cappella. And either way you sing it, that theology is good. I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. As you know, I thought we were going to be turning to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, which is what is published in your program, but the preacher yesterday turned to that passage instead, which you can either say is one of the strangest cosmic accidents ever experienced, and in 40 years of preaching ministry, I have never had that happen before. Or you can say God had a better plan. I'm sticking with that explanation. <laughs> Luke chapter 10. We're going to read beginning in verse 38. While they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice. And it will not be taken away from her. This is one of those passages that in haste, I believe we can make much mess of. For one thing, we're the kind of people, being human beings evidently, who like to separate the world, and like to separate our world, and like to separate the biblical world into the good people and the bad people, the people who do the right thing and the people who do the wrong thing, we, we understand parables like the, the Pharisee and the tax collector in the Gospel of Luke, that great reversal, where it's not the Pharisee, but it's the tax collector who goes down from the temple justified. And Jesus makes clear it's not the surprise that two rather than one went down from the temple justified, but rather that it was the tax collector who went home justified rather than the other. 
Well, there we get it. There's the good and there's the bad. There's the tax collector who responds to God's grace and mercy, knows he needs it, and then there's the Pharisee. And, and we do that with other texts in which it's clear that's exactly the right thing to do. We even have a list of good people and bad people who aren't found in Scripture at all. How many children hearing, or for that matter, let's, let's not let ourselves off the hook, how many adult Christians think there is an innkeeper in the Bible? An evil, hard, cold-hearted innkeeper who tells Mary and Joseph that they can have no place. He's in a lot of Christmas pageants. He's not in the Bible. There is no room in the inn, but there is no evil innkeeper. He's He's a part of our tradition. He's nowhere near Scripture. But he makes us feel better about ourselves at Christmas because surely if we had been there in his place, we would have done differently than he did. This is one of those passages that mixes us up. At first reading, we can think, well, this is exactly like the tax collector and the Pharisee. This is a, here is, here is the, the person who does right and the person who does wrong we can say, all right, we can reduce this to a morality tale. We can say, okay, be Mary, don't be Martha. The problem is we pretty much depend upon Martha 24-7. And not only that, as much as we would like to be Mary, we end up being Martha a great deal of the time. And not only that, the Bible appears to be telling us to be Martha a great deal of the time. What are we going to do with this? Luke tells us that Jesus and his disciples were traveling, and as they were traveling, he entered a village, and there he went into the home of a woman named Martha. Now, what's interesting there is that it's Martha who welcomes Jesus into the home, and just in terms of the, the hospitality code, this is, a, this is an act of graciousness, and, and it's also interesting that in this case, at this point, at, at, at this point, the family residing there identified as two sisters, Mary and Martha. That's what we know now. We're told that she had a sister named Mary. But about Mary, the first thing that we are told is that she also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. So Martha takes the initiative. It's Martha who invites Jesus into her home, an act that is to be seen as an unalloyed good thing. This is, a, this is a sweet expression of hospitality. This is a recognition of what one rightly should do when one encounters Jesus. When Jesus comes into your village, what should you do? You should invite him into your home. You should extend this hospitality. Martha has the hospitality instinct. And aren't you thankful for people who have the hospitality instinct? She, she is, seems to be doing this of of absolute purity of heart. This is just who she is. She's the kind of person who, when Jesus comes to town, is going to be certain to welcome Jesus into her home. Martha is introduced to us as extending welcome to Jesus. Mary is introduced to us as sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he said. That's just a few words. Well, not to rush too quickly. Martha extending hospitality would have been fulfilling a role well understood at the time, non-controversial in and of itself. Mary here is identified in a role that defies expectation. Jesus with his disciples, Jesus with 12 male disciples, Jesus teaching his disciples, nothing unusual there, but a woman sitting at his feet, listening to what he said? Well, we take for granted that that is as it should be. Would not have been taken for granted at the time Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this gospel. Wouldn't have been taken for granted. At the time that Jesus responds to Martha, about Mary sitting at his feet, listening to him teach. What we have here is what we have in the text 
And what we should know is behind the text. Behind the text, even before we get to Martha making inquiry of Jesus concerning Mary, is the fact that just reading the verse, even as Luke tells us in the beginning of his gospel, as he's writing to Theophilus, he says he wants to give him an orderly and accurate account of the things that took place concerning Jesus. Well, this is an orderly and accurate account of something that would have been offensive to many people in first century Judaism. What is this woman doing amongst the disciples? What is this woman doing at the feet of Jesus, listening as if she belongs there? Well, she does belong there, but we don't know that yet. We understand what happens when Martha was distracted by her many tasks. We understand when she came up and asked Jesus, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? She goes on to say, my sister has left me to serve alone. So tell her to give me a hand. One of the things we learn from the Gospels about Jesus when he's confronted with this kind of situation, especially a situation, some kind of domestic conflict, is he says, I'm not here to settle this for you. When he's accosted by those who want him to decide on an inheritance. He said, who may be a judge over you? Well, actually, the father made him a judge over all, but not now for this. He did not come here to be a family court judge. He's not here concerned with, uh, with the kind of trivial pursuits you see people are fascinated to watch on the courtroom television programs. No, it's not why Jesus came. He is indeed a judge. But he didn't come to judge over these trivial matters. But Martha goes to Jesus, and you've got to love the honesty of her question. Lord, don't you care? Now, I can just tell you as a, as a minister, as a preacher, as a pastor, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of statement that is going to offend you from the beginning. Don't you care? Which is to say, if you really did care, you would have acted already. If you did care, Jesus, I wouldn't have had to bring this to your attention. Are you paying attention to what's going on in this household? I welcome you into my house. And here I am getting everything done in order to extend the hospitality that I invited you to receive. It's you and your disciples. This is no small task. There's a lot that has to be done here. And you appear to be untroubled by the fact that my sister is listening to you teach rather than helping me as she should. Don't you care? Well, this is one of those questions that husbands learn they should not ask wives. And wives learn they should not ask husbands. If you have to ask, don't you care, you're actually past the question. We know what this means. But she's clearly affronted. She's, she's indignant that her sister is failing to do what she ought to be doing now, Martha herself is very much employed, frantically employed, at getting everything ready for the hospitality. Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Now, if we are honest, there is not one of us who has not been in Martha's predicament. Those of us who bear responsibility, all of us in this room bear responsibility. We get frustrated when it appears that others are not bearing their responsibility. I think that's a natural human inclination. As a matter of fact, it's almost unavoidable. We can understand Mary here. We can understand why Mary believes, what we can understand Martha, excuse me. We can understand Martha here because we can understand why Martha believes that Mary should be helping her. We, we, we can understand that. Mary does appear to be absent without leave from responsibilities she should be sharing. Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. In verse 41, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. 
Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, if we're going to follow kind of a conventional evangelical way of reading this passage, and accustomed to saying, here's the, here's the good individual, here's the, here's the bad personality type, here's, here's where we see the model of doing the right thing, here's where we see the example of doing the wrong thing, then we will say, if we had followed the eyes of conventional wisdom when we went into the room and we saw Martha serving and Mary just listening, we would have said, Martha's doing the right thing, Mary's doing the wrong thing. But now Jesus turns the world upside down and it's Mary doing the right thing and it's Martha doing the wrong thing. It looks like it's something of a rebuke. The repetition of the name, as you know from the Gospels, is not insignificant. It's intended to add emphasis. This is not just a response. This is a more emphatic response. This is not just a dismissive response as in, Martha, you shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have bothered me with this. You shouldn't have interrupted me with this matter. But rather by saying, Martha, Martha, he's dignifying her. He's speaking to her in a way that is not going to be the response she expects. Maybe even we should say the response she desires but he dignifies her in this response. He doesn't dismiss her. So even as we are shocked by first century sensibilities in the fact that Jesus here was respecting Mary in a way we would not expect by not only allowing but drawing pleasure from the fact that Mary is at his feet listening to him with the disciples. We should also note that Jesus, Jesus affirms Martha here in terms of who she is, his care for her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. Well, all right, so we had in the wearing the white hat Martha, wearing the black hat Mary. Now we have wearing the white hat Mary, wearing the black hat Martha. We've got it. We've been to Sunday school. We can go home. Be Mary, not Martha. It's not exactly wrong, but it's not right. For one thing, we've got to be honest the world appears to ride on Martha. Not just the world, our world. We are in constant need of Martha. We count on Martha. Even as we preach this text and say, be like Mary, somebody's got to be in the kitchen right now being Martha. Otherwise, we've got nothing to eat at the conclusion of this service. Somebody had to be Martha to make certain that this room is ready and the lights are on. So there are all kinds of Martha going on here. Not only that, not only do we need Martha, we often know we have to be Martha. Most of us have a to-do list at the beginning of the day that's longer than the day. And as we get older, the list just gets longer and the day apparently gets shorter. Our to-do list builds up over time and we come to understand as we get older, more people are depending upon us doing this to-do list. We find ourselves, well, just imagine those who are right now in the sandwich generation, as we call ourselves. We've got kids who end up taking up more of our time than we expected, both good and bad. Mary and I have entered into the glorious period, some of you may have heard. <laughs> Uh, of being grandparents. I can just tell you, it's, a, it's the sweetest thing that's ever happened to us in earthly life. And it, it just makes us ridiculously happy. But it also rearranges our priorities. We now have more. There is a birthday in Washington, D.C. We're going to attend. Not only that, but I discover that Mary's flying out early than I am. <laughs> and she's going to, I can't go. I have, I have responsibilities here. I have to worry about many things here. She's got one thing she's worried about. 
And uh, so she's going to go out there. Why? Because she's got to help get things ready for a second birthday party. She has to. It's a mandate. We understand that. Got Martha. I'm married to Martha. I understand that. That's how this works. And, and I count on being married to Martha. We all count on Mary. Don't get lost here. <laughs> being Martha. Because otherwise we won't have any pie uh, tonight. I watch Mary being Martha all the time. And I have to be Martha in my own way. I've, I've got to get these things done. And, uh, and we, we understand that. So as we look at this passage, we can't just say, well, be like this Mary. Don't be like Martha. That happens. No kids get raised. No babies get bathed. No laundry gets done. Nothing happens. And, and not only that, a great deal of the New Testament, and certainly in what, what we find in the book of Acts and what we find in the epistles, is, is, is explanation about how to, be, how to do Martha well. Not just Mary. But this text does tug at us. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Look at that closely. We'll notice that in verses 41 and 42, Jesus doesn't say that the many things about which Martha is worried are meaningless. That they're irrelevant that they're unimportant. He doesn't really rebuke her for being worried about those things. Somebody's gotta be worried about those things. Somebody's got to be feeding that baby who isn't going to wait until after the sermon. Somebody's going to have to be changing those diapers because babies aren't gonna wait until the worship service is over. Somebody's got to be doing all kinds of things even as the preaching of the word of God is taking place. Somebody's got to be doing a lot of these things. And she's, she's worried about them. And let's not chastise her for being worried about them. She's concerned about them. The, the actual language is used here is not as judgmental as might appear in the English. She is upset. But one thing is necessary. You're upset. You're worried about many things. But one thing is necessary. One of the distinctions that is necessary in terms of, well, I just used the word. One of the, it's hard not to use the word necessary in speaking of the things necessary. One of the important principles of reasoning is to understand the difference between necessary and sufficient. Because we can say that this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So just to give an example, we would say it's necessary to affirm the inspiration of Scripture. But it's not sufficient to stop there. There, there are many things necessary. But you have to press on because they then reveal other things to be necessary. But in this case, Jesus is using necessary in its ultimate sense. One thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice. Well, what's the one thing here that characterizes the distinction between Martha? What is Mary doing that Martha's not doing? That, this shifts the equation. The picture gets turned upside down. Now, in Jesus' concern, it's not... Well, Martha's concern is with what she's doing that Mary's not doing. Now the concern seems to be what Mary's doing that Martha's not doing. And what Mary's doing is the one thing necessary. That's a lot bigger, I think, than a quick reading of the text would reveal. The one thing necessary is hearing and obeying Jesus. That's the one thing necessary. The one thing necessary is that when Jesus comes to your village, you listen to what he says, you live on every word, and you obey 
everything he says. Martha knows that when Jesus comes to town, even though she may not know how to articulate this, she may not even know this yet in the flow of gospel history, but she must know in some sense that it's not just a rabbi, a particular rabbi who's coming to town with his disciples. This is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. She, she may not know all of that yet, but her very act of hospitality, as reflected here in Luke's orderly and accurate account, indicates she knows something big is happening here. Mary, when Jesus comes to town, and when Jesus is in her house, she knows that something big is happening here. So she doesn't get busy. She sits. And, and she sits at the feet of Jesus. And she becomes a picture of urgent listening and obedient hearing. Of Jesus, the one thing necessary. Well, certainly the one thing necessary is not to neglect the other responsibilities. But the one thing necessary is not to neglect the preaching of the Word of God. The one thing necessary is not to neglect hearing Jesus as an urgent hearer and as one who will be his obedient disciple. Mary here, sitting with the disciples, listening to Jesus teach, listening to Jesus' words, becomes the picture of the faithful church doing the one thing necessary, the one thing necessary. When we gather together for Christian worship, what is the one thing necessary? We have to have a word from the Lord. We, we, we may have many other things, and we rightly do many other things, but the one thing we must have, the one thing necessary, is a word from Jesus. We, we dare not leave until we've heard from Jesus. We dare not leave until the Bible has been read and the Bible has been preached and the Bible has been heard and God's people are prepared to obey what Jesus has revealed to us. That's the one thing necessary. Now, in order for that one thing necessary to take place, other things have to happen. Other gifts have to be employed. Other concerns, even other worries, have to be tended to. We do count on that. We dare not judge Martha for doing the wrong things. Not when we depend upon her. That would be morally and intellectually dishonest. We can't castigate Martha and then go eat lunch. We're not here to judge Martha. We're here to learn from Mary, from Mary's example. There are a lot of Martha examples in Scripture, and God bless them. We, we don't even often know that they're worried about many things. But that's how families get fed. That's how clothes get mended. That's how, that's how houses get clean. That's how hospitality is extended. That's how... Ministry works. That's how, that's how ministries are organized. That's how meetings are held. That's how punch and cookies are given to children in vacation Bible school. But why do we serve punch and cookies to children in vacation Bible school? It's because we want them to do the one thing necessary. We want them to hear the Word of God. And we want them to be urgent hearers of the Word of God and obedient hearers of the Word of God. The longer I look back on my life, the more I recognize how blessed I was to be surrounded by so many Marthas. God bless them. I perplex Mary at times. My Mary by speaking in my memories, sometimes they're olfactory. I can still remember how the children's rooms smelled in the church in which I grew up. 
And I was there so much of the time. My parents were so involved in the life of this church. I can remember being a toddler. I really can. I can remember being rocked by ladies with these open-toed shoes. And uh, they would rock in these chairs that would creak. And I can remember that. I can remember the windmill cookies. Did you have windmill cookies? Martha brought them. <laughs> and, and, and Martha put them out in, in trays in a, in a circle. And then they served this ridiculously, probably carcinogenic liquid. And with all these vivid colors of, of punch and Kool-Aid and fruit juice. High fructose content, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and we were served this as children. And, then, and that not only that, they had to organize everything. They had to have all the crayons and all the, and all the Bible pictures to color. And they had to have all, uh, and the little chairs and the little tables. And I look at that and I think, I, I was blessed by Martha from the very beginning. And, and then when I was older, Martha showed up. And I don't just mean Martha, but I mean Mike. Uh, they showed up, I, I think, regularly of youth leaders in the church who just gave of themselves. And I mean, really gave of themselves. And, because I have no idea why they did it. It, was, it had to be constant headache. Except they really believed that young people needed to hear the word of God. Needed to be in the fellowship of, of the church. And things needed to be done. Well, in all my life, from the time I was the smallest and the youngest until now, at nearly 58 years of age, I can just tell you, my life, I will never fail to honor Martha. I pray. I never fail to give Martha the honor that is due. I never fail to understand that I wouldn't have heard the word of God as I did. I, I wouldn't have been nurtured in the faith as I was without Martha. And I now know what it means for Martha to be worried about many things. Because these things don't just happen. But we learn here from Mary, who does the one thing necessary. And for Christians, this is really important. This is, this is helpful. It's helpful to us, even in the midst of all the Martha responsibilities, to recognize it's really all about, ultimately, hearing Jesus and obeying him. It's, it's really all about the ministry of the word. That becomes very clear in the early church. Just think of what had to take place when the early church was led by the Holy Spirit to establish the diaconate and, 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 and to set apart men to serve as deacons who would serve the tables. That's Martha. In order that the disciples, the apostles, could give themselves to the preaching of the word. That helps us to understand this text because the diaconate is not chastised for serving the tables, but honored for it. But in order that the apostles could give themselves unreservedly to that one thing necessary, which is the teaching of the word. So here we are we're here gathered together in an institution that is to make sure that what Mary does happens. To, to make sure that in local churches, in churches here we can see and far beyond what we can imagine, the word of God is preached where it otherwise would not be preached. And not only that, that it's preached accurately and it's preached authoritatively and it is preached with power we, we we exist in order to train to educate to inspire to prepare a generation of young men to go out and to preach the gospel but it, it takes a whole lot of martha to to make that happen and so i just want you to know i'm going to be very thankful to martha I want to honor Martha. All the Marthas who make what Mary does possible. Jesus is in the house where Mary is listening only because Martha extended the invitation for Jesus to come in. But Martha does have many worries. 
She's worried about many things. She's upset about them. But Mary has made the right choice. She understands the one thing necessary. The text goes on in its conclusion, not only to say, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice. But Jesus' last words in this passage are these. And it will not be taken away from her. Jesus is saying, Martha, I know you're upset. Martha, you have many concerns. Mary's doing the one thing necessary. She's made the right choice. But you know, she's listened long enough. I'm going to send her off to help you. No, he says this is going to be taken away from her. In the immediacy of the text, it seems to mean Mary's going to stay here and listen. She's made the right choice. It's not going to be taken away from her. But we have in Scripture abundant promise that when the gospel is preached, when the word is preached, it can't be taken away. The one thing we must give people is the word of God. That's the one thing. And it's the one thing that can't be taken away. Everything else is going to be taken away. Eventually, it will all pass away. And, and eventually, everything that Martha has worked on is going to be gone. That doesn't mean it's unimportant. Because Martha has to do a lot of work in order for Mary to hear the word. But the thing is, is that the right choice that Mary made, well... It's the one thing that can't be taken away. You can take away this campus, and you can take away certainly this chapel, and you can take away the pulpit. You can take away your church building. You, you can take away every Christian institution we can imagine, but the preaching of the Word of God, it remains. The, the Bible once preached, it remains. The Word once heard and obeyed, it remains. The one thing necessary is the only thing that remains. Now, that's humbling in one sense because it reminds us that everything else is going to pass away. And everything else will fail to remain. That's humbling. But far more than humbling, this ought to be really encouraging. The preaching of the word, the hearing of the word, the obeying of the word, Listening to Jesus, that's the one thing the world can't take away. Time can't take away. The KGB can't take away. The Communist Party in China can't take away. A secular age can't take away. And that, more than anything else, should keep us at the task of teaching and preaching the Word of God. The one thing that can't be taken away. And for every one of us, to be attentive to the word of God when everything else is taken away. Because the hearing and obeying of the word of God is the one thing that can never be taken away. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray with grateful hearts thankful for that one thing that can't be taken away. Father, we pray to learn from both Mary and Martha, but more than anything else, to learn from Jesus in this passage in order that we too may choose the right thing, the one necessary thing, the one thing that cannot be taken away. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.